I'll be reading from Mark 5, 21 through 34, from the New Revised Standard Version. <clears throat> when Jesus had crossed again in a boat to the other side, a great crowd had gathered around him, and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue, named Jairus, came, and when he saw him, fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, so that she may be made well and live. And so he went with him. And a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had had, and she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, if I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately her hemorrhage stopped and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him, and told him the truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. This is the word of the Lord. I love eating lunch in our big window cafeteria at Baptist Health North Little Rock where I work. Before lunch, I do things like assembling patient lists and getting out the Catholic patient census and going room to room for patient visitation. Matter of fact, just the other day I noticed my next patient to visit was a 99-year-old lady. Okay. I thought, she's probably going to be either sleeping or out of it. So I gently knocked on her door, gently opened it, and peeked in to say, Hello, my name is Kay. But I was surprised. There she was, sitting up in bed, eating a very full lunch, and she didn't want to stop to talk for nobody. I love that. Well, I get that because for me it's always refreshing to take a break in the middle of the day and eat and laugh with my work friends at lunch. We call our friends the lunch bunch. Glenn Norris back there uh, before he retired used to be a vital part of that lunch bunch that would tell tall tales and get it going. So a while back as I was carrying my tray of food to join my lunch bunch, I noticed a most unusual object in the middle of the cafeteria dining room floor. It was a soul. No, not the presence or essence of somebody's body, but rather the actual bottom of a shoe. <laughs> this is it, by the way. There this was. The undersurface of somebody's size 7 shoe lying in the middle of the aisle in the cafeteria dining room. Has someone really walked off leaving part of their footwear behind? While carrying my food tray, I slowly walked past it, looking down at it in wonder. Then I looked at all the numbers of people sitting around in the cafeteria, eating, talking, laughing, visiting, or looking at their phones. How could someone not know that the bottom part of their shoe was missing. Why would they endure such an obvious difference in how it felt to walk? Why is this soul just lying in the middle of all of these people who are coming and going in the cafeteria and no one's noticing? I walked on back to my table and I began to eat and visit with my friends. But the soul was still there right in the middle of the aisle as people walked past it to sit down and eat. It's like nobody saw the bottom of that shoe as they stepped over it. I couldn't stand it any longer, so I got up from my meal, picked up the sole, and threw it in the trash. After cleaning my hands, I returned to finish my lunch. There, Whew, that did it. But I was still bothered by how someone could not know they were missing a sole. Or did they even care? 
And then it hit me. I got up. I went back to the trash. My friends were mortified as I dug through the trash can <laughs> until I found it, the thrown away soul. I took it to the restroom and scrubbed it, and I scrubbed my hands several times with antibacterial soap. And after towel drying the soul, I then alcoholed it profusely. I brought the soul to my office where it sits on my bookshelf to this day, except it's gotten a guest appearance in the church today. It sits on my bookshelf next to my Bible commentaries. It's there to remind me. This lost in a cafeteria shoe soul symbolizes that there are human being souls out there feeling misplaced, broken, incomplete, and detached. There are too many wonderful souls among us who are deeply hurting, who have lost their way, and who are painfully separated from the one who designed them and gave them breath and life. With demanding schedules today, who has the time or even the energy to notice and help these detached, broken, left behind souls? Our answer is found in the scripture passage today. In Mark 4 and 5, Jesus had been teaching and preaching in the synagogue, as well as in the countryside, using parables and stories. If we'll back up just a little bit, at the end of chapter 4, he had just finished one of these long teaching tours and when he and the twelve got into a boat to go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee maybe hoping for a much needed rest. Hey guys, let's get in the boat. Let's, let's get a little rest here, just a day off. But a storm blew up on the Sea of Galilee while they were going across. Out of nowhere that storm blew up, and which had the disciples awakening a very tired Jesus, telling him, they're all going to die. We're all going to die. And he said, no, you're not. And then he told the storm, be quiet and the storm and the disciples calmed down. We move from the end of chapter 4 into chapter 5, and when they arrive after that storm, everything's quiet. At the beginning of chapter 5, they paddle ashore near a place called Gadarenes. When out from behind a grave cave comes a screaming, naked, chain-breaking, grave-sleeping, skin-cutting, demon-befriending man, who ran straight for Jesus and fell on his knees right in front of Jesus. After a few minutes and some more screaming on that man's part, Jesus delivered, restored, and reinstated this outcast of an individual. The legion of demons that were in this man were then cast out into the herd of pigs near them who promptly stampeded down a hill into the lake and drowned. You might say they became water hogged. Get it? I know. I, th I thought it was good. <laughs> Although the man formerly known as Legion was forever grateful, the response of the townspeople? They promptly asked Jesus and his motley crew to pack up and leave their region. So, after tons of teaching, going through a storm, making it to the other side, healing a man possessed of demons, they had to get back in the boat and sail back over to the other side. More likely, more than likely, they docked on the shore of Capernaum. But before Jesus and his disciples could hardly get their land legs, a large crowd of onlookers had circled around him, they just had to see Jesus. And really, who wouldn't want to see this miracle worker and be near this teacher who spoke with authority from heaven? I would want to. I would have to be there. I would be pushing and shoving my way to see him too and to hear him. Not only were the crowds eager to meet Jesus, but also Jairus, the administrative official of the local synagogue, ran up to Jesus, fell at his feet, pleading for Jesus to come to his house to heal his 12-year-old daughter who was dying. So Jesus went with him. Now I want, want us to notice something. This is the second person in Mark 5 
to fall at Jesus' feet. The second person. The first person was the demoniac who ran up to him and fell at his feet. The second person, Jairus, ran up to him and fell at his feet. So let's keep count. Let's keep an eye out for that. Getting to Jairus' house was no easy task because everyone pressed in around Jesus trying to get a good look at the rock star of their day. It probably looked like some kind of parade going down Main Street with everybody trying to hear him or see him or touch him. I mean, really. If they had drum corps in those days, they would have been there announcing the arrival of someone famous coming into town. Some folks may have actually tried to touch his hands or his face. Some may have ripped a piece of material off his cloak or pulled some of his hair out for a souvenir. Kind of like people do today when they're pressing in around their favorite star. Some may have gone home bragging. See this hand? This hand touched Jesus of Nazareth. I will never wash this hand again, to which all the people in the family moaned and groaned. <coughs> no, this hand touched him. That was a bragging point. You know, for a crowd like that to be there, they had to make sacrifices. They really did. Sacrifices of time, sacrifices of work, and possibly a sacrifice of uh, loss of cash flow due to a, a labor shortage in the middle of the day all to see Jesus. They made a sacrifice to see Jesus. Also in the crowd, the Gospel Mark tells us there was a very fragile, tainted, untouchable, diseased woman who was desperate for help, for hope, and for healing. She probably wasn't sure if all she had heard about Jesus was more myth than miracle, more superstition than supernatural, but I'm betting she didn't care. She'd been hemorrhaging for 12 years without any cure and without any hope for getting better. No matter what procedure she had or how many doctors she saw, she just could not stop the progression of her disease. And then she had run out of money. No more money, no more treatment. She had run out of options or so she probably thought. And then her last option showed up walking down Main Street. We know that the Jewish law as found in Leviticus declares this nameless woman to be ceremonially unclean due to her bleeding issue. She was not permitted, permitted to enter the temple for religious ceremonies. And according to the law, anything or anyone she touched became unclean as well. The fact that she was in the crowd pressing around Jesus means that each person who bumped into her would have become unclean, including Jesus. I bet the townspeople had had it with her. I mean, she'd been hanging around town, sick, awful, for a long time. I mean, here she was again, needy, begging, pleading, seeking, stinking, ugly, and making everybody else very uncomfortable and very unclean. And all they're trying to do is to see this famous person. Could she not just please stay away? This woman's constant hemorrhage was a disaster that left her anemic, breathless, hardly able to walk, in poverty, and generally despised by most, if not by all. In the midst of all this hoopla of people pressing in on Jesus as he was trying to make his way to Jairus' house, this woman managed to be one of those who also touched him. Matthew 9.20 says that she came up behind him and touched the hem of his garment. Now the hem can be any edge of his cloak. It could be the edge of the sleeve or the bottom of his garment. She may have tugged on his sleeve. She very well may have touched his sleeve. But what if she touched the bottom of his cloak? Think about that. What if her sickly, brittle body could not fight 
for a place among the standing, could not elbow her way in and stand her ground. So within the jostling of the crowd, she collapsed and was trampled by the stronger, more assertive ones. Maybe, just maybe, she raised her head in time to see, amid the sea of feet and ankles and dust, his ankles walking past her. And in that moment, she reached for a fleeting touch through all of that sea of ankles and feet and dust, snatching at the bottom edge of his garment to hope against hope that something might change for her. And it did. When I was a campus minister at Baylor University in Waco, Texas, there you go, Chris, I taught our student leaders about this same passage in Mark. To illustrate the story, I got up and walked over to a freshman and placed my hand on his shoulder. And I asked, do you feel anything special? He squirmed and looked embarrassed and he said, no. Okay, all eyes in the group followed me as I went over to another student, a senior. I touched the top of her head and I asked, do you sense anything? She nervously laughed and said, no. <laughs> The students had all become wary of me by now and were hoping I wouldn't pick on any of them with any more crazy questions. But I went over and laid my hand on a sophomore's hand. I laid my hand on top of a sophomore's hand and I asked her, is anything happening? And she jerked her hand away and said something like, ew, no. And by this time, I had made all of them very uncomfortable. And I explained to them, that I proved that my touch did nothing for them except make them feel squirmish, but that there was a touch in the Gospel of Mark that truly made a transformative difference in one woman's life. Fast forward, when I started my year of training as a chaplain at um, Baptist Health. During my first year as a resident chaplain, I was required to lead worship services at Baptist Rehab Institute on Sundays when I was on call. One Sunday as I was on call in the rehab dining room where all the patients gathered for worship, I decided to teach on this scripture. As the place filled up with patients, family members, and some staff, I started my time with this exercise that I had done with my Baylor students. I walked over to a man in a wheelchair and I touched his head and I asked, sir, do you feel anything special when I touch your head? Oh, yes, he said, thank you, he said. Oh. Dis disconcerted a bit, I moved to a woman and I touched her arm and I asked, ma'am, does my touch seem to change you in any way? Yes, yes it does, she exclaimed. This was not going the way I meant for it to go. <laughs> the room was packed with people, by the way. <clears throat> I tried one more time with an older, quieter gentleman. Sir, when I touch your back, does that do anything to you? Yes, it does, he exclaimed. Thank you, he said. I then realized my introduction to this Bible story was not going to work, and I quit trying. But as I backed off from the people, things began to backfire. As patients started raising their hands throughout the group and calling out, touch me, come touch me, no, come touch me. It was sad and it was amazing. Touch me. No, no, come here and touch me. I just knew I was going to get fired before my chaplain year was up. These folks who were rehabbing in the hospital taught me that the smallest touch of compassion really does matter. We're going to go back and evaluate this in just a second, so hang on to that story. When the religious, law-breaking, ailing, outcast of a woman managed to get a fleeting touch of him, Jesus stopped to a screeching halt. He felt power go out of him, he said. Searching the crowd, he asked, 
Who just touched my clothes? Well, so many people had touched him. But he kept looking, kept scanning the crowd. His eyes darted from face to face and from person to person. His disciples, who were dismayed and embarrassed, declared to Jesus that everybody had been touching him. They practically admonished him in their reply in verse 31. You see the, crowd, the people crowding against you, and yet you can ask who touched me? Can you hear the admonishment in that? They were embarrassed. And they had a good point. If the crowd was touching and pressing in on Jesus, why didn't he stop for each one who brushed up against him or grabbed his hand or kissed his face? Why didn't the Bible record a number of who touched me that day? Who touched me? Who touched me? You touched me? Who touched me? Who touched me? It didn't. Remember the college students and the hospital patients when I did the touch exercise? Compare responses between the older wheelchair-bound patients and the college students. We're putting no one down in this, but we want to compare. What made the difference between their reactions and their responses? We could say, besides age, wisdom, and experience, what made the difference? Think. Need. Need. One group needed the touch. One group was repelled, was embarrassed. So why did Jesus stop for only one feeble woman instead of everyone who touched him? Maybe some came to see Jesus because they were curious and wanted to see for themselves this controversial figure. Maybe some were in the crowd because they were very religious and wanted to spot check everything Jesus said and did to make sure it all complied with the Jewish law. Maybe some showed up because they are always looking for the next spiritual high. Maybe some came because it was the latest entertainment in an otherwise boring town. Maybe some came because their wives or their mothers made them, so they felt obligated to be there. But there was one person who came because, just like the raging demoniac man, and like Jairus, the desperate father pleading for his daughter's life, they all needed Jesus. They all needed Jesus. Suddenly, out of the push and shove of the crowd, this gaunt, unclean, law-breaking woman fell down, third person, right in front of Jesus. Notice the type of people who are getting close to Jesus, who are engaged with Jesus, who receive His power. It's not the scholars, not the businessmen, not even the religious leaders. It's the disposables of the culture. A crazy person, a woman, a child. Those were the disposables of their culture back in that day. All eyes were on this woman. The whole crowd got quiet, straining to see what brought the party to a standstill. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was entirely focused on one outcast, a little scrap of unknown humanity. Her loneliness and illness had put all heaven in a rage, and God sent His Son for her alone at that moment. Then came Christ's verdict, the same one who will one day judge the nations and pronounce His verdict on the mighty empires, the Lord and Maker of heaven and earth, paused for a moment and said, Daughter, 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 Your faith has healed you. Go into peace. Did you notice the math in this story? I'm not a math person at all. But the ratio here is easy to figure. Those who walked away transformed by Jesus in this story were one 
to a crowd. Just one was transformed. And the Bible poses the unspoken question, which side of the ratio will we fall on? Will we be the one person to touch God and be touched by God? Or will we be the crowd contented just being around God, being near God, checking in on God when he comes through town and letting that be enough? Will we be the one to push, push past the very religious, the curious, the experience seeking, the obligated to come, the please entertain me so that we can grab a hold of God? Will we dare to reach out, dare to fall before Jesus, dare to tell him the whole truth? If so, we can know a transformation like never, ever before. Then we will experience the touch that makes a difference. In the push and shove of life, Jesus sees and engages those who are disconnected, discouraged, and dejected. Jesus helps those who know they are incomplete and imperfect. He delights being with those who need him. Delights. Jesus is on the lookout for those of us who know we need him. Seen any lost, hurting, and displaced souls lately? Maybe feel like one yourself sometimes? If so, there is a Savior who knows where these souls have landed. And He can reach down and make them new, whole, and complete. But remember the math. It's one to a crowd. May we be that one in this holy, eternal equation. Let us pray. Lord God, Thank you. Thank you that you are ready to touch those of us who reach you with true need, who are ready to come before you to tell the whole truth. Thank you that you are there to give us the power, the renewal. I pray, Lord, that you will continue to fill us, the church, with your strength, your spirit, and your calling. We love you, Lord. Come speak even now. In Jesus we pray. Amen.